According to my parents, raising children in the country, all cities were bad. My foods are not good for you. They're evil. They taste funny and they have crap in them. But no, <laughs> that doesn't happen because it's a family function. And why would anything go as planned? Most of my time is really good because I spend a lot of it reading and having good cups of coffee. When you start talking about the past, it's impossible to stop. Stolperstein is a German word which literally means stumbling stone, or metaphorically, a stumbling block or a stumble upon. Today, in all parts of Europe, it is a 10 by 10 centimeter concrete cube. That would be 3.9 inches by 3.9 inches of American, upon which a brass plate has been placed bearing the name and life dates of victims exterminated or persecuted by the Nazis. In 1992, German artist Gunther Deming inter- initiated the Stolperstein Art Project, and it is still ongoing to date. Its aim is to commemorate individual persons at the exact last place of residency or work which was freely chosen by that person before he or she fell victim to the Nazi terror. As of the end of last January, 56,000 Stolperstein have been placed in 22 European countries. I am Sue, the Duchess of Faraway nearby, and I am here with my co-host, DJ Star Sage. Hello. Hi, how's it going, DJ? Doing pretty good, and yourself? Pretty good. And today's special guest is Brenda Boo of Life on the Shit List. And the three of us will review the 2011 documentary film, The Flat, by Arnon Goldfinger. Hello. How are you, Brenda? I'm good. How are you guys doing? Not too bad. It's okay. getting to be spring. Yeah, it's sunny here. <laughs> <laughs> Can I just tell you the very first thing that grabbed me about this uh, documentary was the fact that the guy who made it, his last name was Goldfinger. I I got a lot of pleasure out of that. Yes. (laughs) I I sort of every time I every time I see it or say it, it sort of it sort of throws me for a loop, I guess. Yeah, Yeah, I expect that song to to show up right in the background. (laughs) Plus, the second thing that grabbed me was how much I had to fucking read it. Mm. Sorry. Reading movies is not my favorite thing. This was an excellent documentary, but my eyeballs were hurting by the end of it. And, yeah. And they never it, translate completely, right? It's always like, da, 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 da. and then it comes up on the screen as two words. And I'm like, right. I think you said more than that, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it, it is my understanding that in Europe and, and much of the rest of the world, rather than putting subtitles, you know, little translations. They just, they dab it into their language. According to Wikipedia, Time Out Tel Aviv chose to place the film at the top of its recommended films for 49 weeks under the headline. One not to miss, I believe is what it said. And chose it as one of the 25 most important artworks from around the world for 2011. What follows are brief outlines of the events that took place during each segment of the film. Discussion and questions will follow each. Act 1. The Flat The grandmother has passed away, leaving 70 years of memories for her family to process. Personal treasures are appraised and evaluated as worthless. Arnon A grandson rescues, discards, and begins to uncover a mystery. This is my grandmother, Gerda. A month ago, she died. Since then, no one has been here. Everything remains as it was. Now we have a difficult task to decide what stays and what goes. The grandparents knew German, but not Hebrew. The grandchildren knew Hebrew, but not German. But they all seemed to know English, including Hannah, their daughter and the mother of of the children, uh, grandchildren. Um, Family history was not passed on to either the daughter or to the grandchildren. 
in your family, did you see see those kinds of things happen as well, where you didn't really learn anything about your family background? So, yeah, absolutely. There was a lot of uh, lack of information coming from my parents' generation. Uh, every time I would ask just just really kind of generic, not intrusive questions, I got a lot of I don't knows, uh, I don't remember, just it seemed like a burden to them and we were not affected or in in any way <laughs> a part of the Holocaust. So I don't know if it's a generational thing, but I felt like Hannah, Arnon's mother, was so exasperating. I just wanted to wring her neck. She was just <laughs> like he would present her with evidence like, Here they were friends with Nazis and she's like, I don't know. I don't think that's from my grandmother. Uh, yes, it is. Here it is. <laughs> I don't know. I don't really think that's true. <laughs> like, that's great. How about you, DJ? Did you, were your parents forthcoming about your background? Well, um, in in my case, there there was a little bit of a mystery in the past. Um, my dad's parents divorced before I was born, so that, of course, immediately led me into the curiosity realm of I need to know. <laughs> What you know? What was it that I wasn't told about? So I, I um, sort of identify with the uh, the main person in this film, who was the the filmmaker Arnon, the grandson, because mm-hmm. he's been handed this mystery with his grandparents' estate, and he's not getting any answers from his mother. So I I think that um, that's what grabbed me right from the beginning was that I, I've got to sit through this because you know he and I. Um, have that in common that we have a curiosity about the past and I think that that frustrated me too that the mother was just in denial she's like no that's that's not my family that's not what I knew growing <laughs> up <laughs> well it, she does that does seem very very frustrating and my family there was a lot of family history I I knew aunts and uncles and second and fourth cousins and and we went to see people that were related somehow but I never figured out who how that were in nursing homes and and uh, rest homes and we had the the uh, my great grandfather was a a civil war history uh, well not a hero but he had fought in the civil war and he passed away in a home for uh, soldiers for disabled soldiers or whatever and so there was a lot of history however in my 50s I learned that almost all of it was was something of a lie it was all just sort of made up out of whole cloth (laughs) I found it interesting that when Arnon's cousin came to visit she talked about how when her grandmother who assumingly was one of Arnon's uh, grandmother's sisters possibly that she missed hearing German spoken. So she came to visit Arnon's grandmother so that she could hear her speak German around her. They made it clear that um, Arnon's grandparents didn't consider themselves from, they weren't identifying so much with Israel as their own um, coming from German. They consider themselves Germans. I feel like this is just a subtle way of saying, okay, I live here. This is, this is safe. This is my new homeland. But they didn't consider themselves truly. I mean, if you went to their apartment, it was like a time capsule. Yeah. So I don't really feel like they they were fully invested on some kind of a deep level that that's where they lived because they went back to Germany so much and had all those German texts. And Einstein was not exactly convinced that he was not a German. I, it seems to me that he was rather confused about the idea that people wanted to kill him because he was Jewish. He was a German scholar. You know, there there are there were a number of people that were were very hurt because they felt they were German. They were very well integrated into the German society, mm-hmm. more so than in any other country in Europe. It wasn't until after. Uh, the wartime, or maybe it was during the wartime that there became a Jewish state, right? Palestine was the predecessor to Israel, 
And that's part of what happened with Arnon's grandparents is that they moved to the Middle East to become part of that chapter in history of forming yeah. Israel. Yeah, it didn't exist Good. before World War II. When the family gathered at the apartment, no one seemed interested in the items from the past. Arnon found treasures in the letters of his grandparents of his grandparents' friends and said he and said he saved anything that smelled as if it were one hundred years old. Do you have treasures from the past? Do you have any heirlooms? Well, my family came from a very um, working class, probably lower or maybe upper lower class. So <laughs> anything that they had probably wasn't worth a damn. So anything that I would have would be just things that were associated with them, like something you would always see at their house. The only mm-hmm. kind of nostalgic reason to collect. So the only thing I would have liked to get my hands on in my in my history was apparently when my grandma passed away on my dad's side, she had journals and oh. she died. She specifically said, burn these when I'm dead. And my grandpa did that. I would have loved to got a hold of those. <laughs> I never got to know my grandma. So mm-hmm. that, that I, that uh, starting with Jane Austen, who's the first person I ever heard of who asked to have that done. I, it just seems really wrong to me. Yeah. You know, you're dead, you're gone. What difference does it make if somebody reads your journal? And some of them are so important. We've learned so much about our past by reading journals. And there would not be a history of women if it were not for journals. I suppose it's it's all about hurting the people that remain in life's feelings and not really wanting every single thought that popped into her head to be digested for the you know, for the rest of the well, world. That could yeah. have been a moment. Oh, could have been just a moment in time. I resent my mother. I hate the way yeah. she blah blah blah. Well, maybe she doesn't want that imprinted on her mother's psyche. I I don't begrudge them from getting rid of their journals. I'm just saying I would have liked to get a hold of it. That's all. Yes, I am. Um, well, I do sort of begrudge them because when I have looked at journals. Now, not all journals, because I'm I'm not a big reader of, of journals. But when I have looked at personal journals from our family, I find old recipes that have been joggled and jiggled in here and there and may still exist within the family. I find lists of, of uh, like a budget, you know, how much I spent on flour, how much I spent on sugar how much rent was that those kinds of things it's journal the journals the personal journals i've seen are, are you know there may be a few notes about personal things but mostly they're about keeping your head above water mm-hmm. I, I i don't and maybe that's just in my family right um, i i certainly didn't have a real literary family and, right <laughs> In in my case, um, treasures from the past. Well, um, a lot of the history in my family was sort of lost to me, at least because I was the youngest of the family. Mm-hmm. So a lot of those things had already been passed on to aunts and uncles and people <laughs> older than me. Actually, I do have one thing, and I would I I do think that this is probably my most treasured possession. Um, when I was a child and I was learning to walk, I was in the playpen, and my dad was assembling a kit clock, so a, a grandmother clock. And so my first words were TikTok because <laughs> I liked the clock that my dad was putting together, and mm-hmm. that has been passed down to me. It's sitting in my dining room for when we're done with our remodel so that we can get it tuned and have that play. The other <laughs> thing that I don't quite have but I have my eye on is that um, through my my genealogy research, I've come to know some of my distant cousins, and one of those is my second cousin, and she's my grandfather's niece. So in this case, uh, my great-grandparents were her grandmother and grandfather, and she has my grandfather's pocket watch from the railroad, so it may be a retirement gift from that time, and Mm -hmm. sitting under a glass dome in her home, now, I, I wouldn't have my own designs on it, but I know for a fact that 
um, her only child has no interest in that part of the family history. If mm-hmm. It's not her name. Well, in my family, I think mostly what we inherited were like embroidery things, you know, women, women's work. I, I do have a journal of recipes that came from my great, great grandmother, I think, that she used when she was serving at some rich people's house in the town where she lived. And I got that because it came, it, my grandmother had it, and she had an old maid daughter. And I also inherited the old maid daughter, uh, <laughs> which, mm-hmm. and and through her I also have uh, some chests and and that kind of thing, but they aren't particularly precious. My, could, could we just talk about the mass of stuff that was in that apartment? I love the fact that she had all these lady things, all those gloves and purses. Oh, all that stuff was just fascinating to me and. At one point, they were saying they were throwing away 60 garbage bags a day. And I, I just, I just I thought, wanted it. <laughs> I just wondered, like, if none of that could have been distributed amongst the family. Like, it all seemed so, like, crazy grandma. She hoarded all this stuff, but it was all vintage and looked like it was in really good shape and well, and they didn't seem to understand what it was. Well, you know, it, well, I think they knew what it was. I just don't think it meant anything to them. Well, I don't know. They were, they were. There was that scene where they were looking at the fox, the fox shawls. Yeah, well, those she were- had her fox collars or something. I know that they are 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 not. Um, Who wants to have a, a thing with its face and its feet dangling? Right. <laughs> I mean, they could have chopped off those feet. Come on. Just, you know, they could have stuffed it. It would have made a great stuffed animal. It just brings back scenes from Ghostbusters movies to me. What they <laughs> could have liked. But, but I, I wondered what was in those 60 bags. I couldn't believe what, that they were just throwing that stuff away. A few years ago, my husband's grandparents passed away, and they lived into their ripe age of 90s, just like mm-hmm. the grandparents in this uh, documentary. And I just can't imagine going through all of that. You know, as you were saying, Brenda, 60 bags a day were getting thrown out. I was there for just a short part of the time that the estate was being gone through, and I was just having a sandwich in the front living room, and they didn't even realize I was still there. The uh, oldest daughter of the family, her whole attitude was, I can't wait to get home, but, you know, just put all of this in the trash. And it's just sad, as you're saying, you know, that there are pieces of their history here and they're not even holding on to them. It's like because of the the shock of the events of history, suddenly, you know, intimate and personal things have become disposable. It doesn't matter that this might have been grandma's favorite pair of gloves and maybe these were what she wore in her anniversary photo. Suddenly they're, oh, that's just one upon tons of them, you know, dump it. Well, I must admit the gloves did look like that. Although, did you notice that the daughter kept one pearl cl- hand clutch and a pair of pearl trimmed gloves that were, that apparently went with it? And she had them laid out on the on on the bed or something at one point, it, like they were displayed. And I thought that I I felt like she was going to take those home and that. Well, when he dumped that armoire, whatever that was, over the balcony, I about oh god, get myself because you know that was like some original piece that had been around, and I just like you fucker, it looks so nice. I know that might have even been a grandparent's possession. In my history, if you were going to get rid of something like that, that doesn't go over the balcony and into the trash. That goes to the thrift store. I just thought this was probably handcrafted. There was no way this probably came from a factory. I just feel like the mother was really a modern woman in terms of, like, no nonsense. This is just a bunch of junk. She didn't have, like, very much kind of romanticism about her parents and her parents' history. So it's easy for, I guess it's easier for us to sit back and like, look at all these treasures and just dumping it. I'd love to have that. But she was so like, of the now, let's get this done. And he, his, her son even said that, like, my mother, before she goes out of 
on an adventure, she gets things done. And she had those collectors up there and like, okay, do you want it? No? Okay. Next. <laughs> She's very practical. Just in, in, in a closing thought, I knew a young woman. She was a graduate student in the English department when I was, when I was a student there. And for some reason, we were about the same age, and I got to know her fairly well. And she was from, she was the only daughter of a, of a, of parents who survived the Holocaust. Now, they had been in the camps, and I don't know what difference that makes. But they were very reluctant to talk to her about all things past, and they were, were just sort of in the moment and, and what is new is better than what is old than we used to have. And I think that was just part of the experience. And I'm and assuming that it affected you if you were Jewish, even if you left Germany and, and were not in danger. Well, one of her, the grandmother's oldest friends said that first generation from the Holocaust, family members didn't discuss it. The next generation did, and she said something like, and I'm I'm glad you don't understand why it's too painful for people to talk about it. It's just like yeah. 9-11. Like 9-11 is very much still in our current minds. We live through it, and this gonna, it's going to take time before people can look back at it, and it's just an event in history. This was all very personal, very raw, and yeah. I don't see how... You know, there's very much that attitude of that generation where, like, I can't do anything about it. That's the past. Let's leave it in the past. Well, we all know now that you have to process these horrible things that happen. And I don't think they were of that mindset at that. You know, they didn't know that, that it was better to talk things out. Act two. Arnon rekindles a friendship. After discovering his grandparents' letters to the Mildensteins, Arnon initiates contact, then visits Germany. I'm uh, calling from uh, Tel Aviv, from Israel. My name is uh, my name is Arnon Goldfinger, yeah. and I'm uh, the grandson of Kurt and Gerda Tuchler. You aren't. Yeah, I am. <laughs> Why did Hannah not know about the renewed friendship between the von Mildensteins and the Tuchlers? Indeed, it seems that she was unaware of the two couples' friendship either before or after the war. It seems that the friendship must have been really private, almost secretive. Well, to me, that didn't seem like it would be all that un unheard of that a child wouldn't know what kind of relationships the parents had um, my parents again s similar generations they didn't advertise what they were doing sometimes I felt like in my own home I was like everything was on a need to know basis and you don't need to be in the loop on this so um, I don't it, it, there could have been some stigma about them knowing that he was a Nazi there's always that factor but in terms of just a normal parent child relationship that doesn't seem all that weird and, and to me, um, there is some emphasis that the daughter, Hannah, um, even though she was born in Germany, the most of her life she's known as been in the, there in Israel. So that's basically, um, you know, not even her childhood home. But I, I think in that same sense that it was none of her business, um, you know, what her, her parents did. The fact that um, she was in another country, maybe she, you know, had other things going on. I, I certainly didn't know um, the kinds of friends my parents had. Of course, they, they didn't really have much of a, a social life. I mean, you got four kids at home. You have to have so many babies if you're going to have a dinner out. But, you know, I, I don't think that I would be able to tell you who all of my parents' friends were. But certainly it, it's an interesting idea that her parents kept in touch with these people after the war and maybe maybe that's why she didn't know about it because 
I, I doubt that her parents could talk with their friends about the fact that they kept in touch with this this German couple that they knew before the war. Because certainly, if that was brought up, they'd be like, "What? Are you are you crazy? You're you're still talking to these people?" <laughs> However, all of the people that Arnon talks to about his grandparents and the uh, von the von Middelsteins. They seemed relatively open about it. You know, they they didn't. It was not a secret, as far as I could tell. But well, they had the that they history. That they too. saw those people that you know there was the um, that the people that interviewed the the grandmother. Now I think the grandfather was had passed away by the time that that interview about it was in that magazine. Mm-hmm. And that he went and talked to the couple that did the interview and, and wrote the article. They said it was a little odd, the, the the gathering where they went and talked to him. And it was treated sort of like a social thing. And it was kind of tense. But I think that the two reporters made it a tense situation. Well, what what I took from that, and I watched it just a few minutes for, you know, the umpteenth time just a few minutes before <laughs> – I, I was trying to pick up on some of the little nuances that I might mm-hmm. miss, and the reporters were basically saying that you know although the the von Mildensteins wrote to the Tuchlers, the grandparents in this case, um, and, and they were trying to clear their name of anything that went on during World War II, mm-hmm. the grandfather wouldn't have any any of it. He he wasn't playing into their ploy to clear their name, so they they may have somehow remained friend, friends, quote-unquote, over the years, but the grandfather wouldn't, you know, uh, take action in clearing their name. I do remember the grandmother calling it a, a whitewash, or the whitewash letter, mm-hmm. that they came for the whitewash letter. And apparently that was a common thing and people, you know, in Israel received. After World War II, that is one of the things that that Germany wanted to do is to they wanted to a never forget that they had done these horrible things, and they wanted to to bring back the the, the Germans who had left. They, for instance, the the Jewish population. But Germany has been better than any other country in Europe about providing access and and, and places to live and places to, to deal with the society because they, they want to make amends. And they've got this never forget kind of thing. But When Arnon went to Germany and met the daughter of the von Mildensteins, um, one of the people he talked to was her husband. And, you know, there's, there is a cute little banter there about him not feeling accepted at first because the von Mildensteins descended from gentry, as he put it. But, yes. but he he said the point that Brenda had made that, you know, when these atrocities were happening, the common everyday German citizen wasn't aware that these concentration camps had been organized, that when the British and American troops liberated the camps, this was, uh, in many cases, the first time that they'd heard of these horrible things that were happening. Because, you know, if, if, if you think about it, yes, um, the, the Nazis were an occupying force in Europe, but they also uh, took over the country, basically. So they, they were, on some level, a political party. And at some level, the German people, unfortunately, unbeknownst to them, maybe, allowed those... Uh, activities to occur because you know somebody ran for office this is their platform and yeah. he elected them and now these horrible things are happening so you know t- uh, to bring it back to that point the Germans weren't aware that these horrible things were happening maybe behind their backs until it was exposed by you know the, the allied forces but well, what I find interesting is we were saying about um, the Tuchlers staying in touch with them and not necessarily the rest of the family. I think that maybe we're missing some elements of truth from the story that, yes, they found these letters and we see that they have been, they had corresponded in the past, but in all honesty, you know, the grandparents lived into their 90s. 
Were they in touch with that family in the last 20 years? Probably not. Um, but we do know that the Tuchlers were in touch with the, the, the von Mildensteins uh, when the daughter was young because she had the the locket from yes. his grandmother. And and they must have been in, in touch with them well into their – as they got older because the daughter – of the uh, the daughter or granddaughter of the the Van Mildensteins knew them and was aware of them, and she knew a lot more about the Tuchlers and their family than uh, the Tuchlers' family. The Tuchler family did not seem to know anything about the Van Mildenstein family, but the Van Mildenstein offspring seemed to know more about the Von Tuch or the Tuchlers. So. I, I don't know what to make of that necessarily. I do know that I listened to a young woman who was the daughter of what she thought was a Nazi officer, not necessarily a, a uh, not a high officer, but a, an army officer, mm-hmm. and who had an uncle she believes was in the SS. Now, nobody talks about this. As far as her family was concerned, none of her family belonged to the military. They just were there because that's that's what they want you to believe, that they didn't know. And she says, how could you not know? When these trains come through and they unload, they got to have smelled. She was of the belief that it was impossible for Maybe not the entire population, but the people who lived around those towns and were and because they were not in isolation. There were people that lived in the forest and, the, you know, or lived on the edge of the forest and who were farmers and and what have you. There were people there yeah. and they and, and she is convinced they had to have known. But you never, ever talked to a person from Germany that knew. But you have to remember too that when there would be people that um, that tried to put together a f- forces against the Nazis, they would one of the things they would do is they'd find out where that person was from and they'd go and they'd bomb the whole village. Well, they yes, had, that that too. So um, I mean, there was a lot of intimidation. There's a lot of like, I'm sure there was a lot of like, okay, that doesn't have anything to do with me. I'm going to go and live my day to day life. Well, I, I'm sure that I'm sure that's true. I, I I would not. I mean, somebody who is going to shoot you if you look at them the wrong way is not exactly someone that you're going to question. Don't you think there's just a lot of denial? I mean, shit has happened in our lifetimes where we couldn't believe it was happening, and then we found out after the fact that it was. Like, I don't remember the name of the country, but in Africa, where those different. Um, uh, tribes were coming in and killing and raping the I women. I want to say Rwanda. Yeah, nobody could believe that was going on, but it yeah, was. Yeah, except it was, yeah. Act three. Hannah visits Germany, and her son's her son's. Re- after her son's return from return, the daughter of the Tuchlers is convinced to visit the city of her birth. There she confronts the reality of her grandmother's death. Anna? Wie bitte? Würdest du hier wohnen? Nein. Hier nicht. Hier nicht. Hier nicht. Ja. Außerdem wohnen will ich, wo ich wohne. The dialogue that we just played was in German, and it was a conversation between Hannah's cousin that her family hadn't stayed in touch with. It was a relation uh, through, a grand, uh, through a grandparent. Mm. And they were walking down the street in his neighborhood, and he asked her, would you ever live here? You know, asking her if she might think about moving back. When in reality, he was basically trying to trigger her memory. He was like, you know, do you recognize this place? And it's at that moment that she realizes she's in one of the family's old neighborhoods, and she talks about remembering the house that she was in front of because it was a friend of her grandmother's. After Hannah's grandmother's letters were found, Hannah learns that she's been lied to about her own grandmother's death. She hadn't merely died, but was murdered in the concentration camps. If the letter had been found while Goethe was still alive, 
do you think Hannah would have been mad at her? Would you be upset if a family kept such a secret? Well, it is a pretty big secret. Um, it seems like Hannah took it in stride, although I think maybe in stride is more about just processing it and uh, putting up a good a good front from the camera and a lot of denial. So I, I would be definitely upset if that information was kept from me. I think that I would probably be mad. I don't know if if I could be mad at my own mother. I mean, certainly, you know, there 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 is that thought of um, you know, am I mad enough about the situation versus being mad at my mother personally? You know, in this case where they've talked about, you know, certain generations of of German Jews don't talk about the past, and the grandson being the filmmaker in this. He's, you know, a generation removed from all that. But his mother, you know, she she said that she wasn't interested in that. Her parents didn't really talk about the past. So I guess I could understand if it were my situation that I find these letters and I find out that my grandmother was writing to me. But I get the impression that she was quite young at that point point when her parents left Germany that she maybe wasn't even you know in middle school so even if she had been if she had been aware of it she may not have understood what was going on but you know that 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 definitely would cause me to question whether my mother had hidden other things from me because and you know she's like now learning that grandma didn't die she was killed Mm-hmm. So she's got more of a personal attachment to the Holocaust. I mean, yes, her people were displaced by this horrible tragedy, but now it's personal. Her own grandmother was taken from her life because she was persecuted. Yeah, um, yeah I, think, I, I think that would be very disturbing uh, to have separated herself so much from from the experience of the Jewish population and the Holocaust, and then to find out that there really was a, a, a very strong connection there, I think that would have to be upsetting. But as Brenda said, it would take a while to process it. You'd, you'd have to go through it, you know, perhaps for a long time before you could really get it through your head and, and heart. It's something that I found... Um, not really hard to sit through, but um, something that I found particularly sad was when they showed Hannah reading her grandmother's letters and she's coming to the realization that these aren't some other person's letters. Because she was in denial at first. She's like, no, these mm-hmm. can't be hers. And she's reading them and she's realizing that her grandmother is asking for favors. She's telling her daughter Please have my granddaughter pray for me. Please make sure that my granddaughter remembers me. And that crushed me. It, normally, when you, you watch a film or a documentary in this case, you're just learning about history. And there's not necessarily personal accounts. But this is somebody reading a letter. And it's in the handwriting of her grandmother, somebody who's not there anymore. We are talking about things just being thrown away. This could have been easily thrown away. This is something that's not typed out. It's in her grandmother's handwriting. There's evidence of her existence in front of her. Although I kind of wondered, you know, in in the beginning of the film, or maybe it was in the middle of the film, there was this thing about how Hannah had to handle each piece of paper. Mm -hmm. And she read all the bills and such. But when it came to those letters, these aren't important. These are people we don't know. You know, let's just throw them away. That seemed really backwards to me. (laughs) She was very dismissive. Like when she was going through a pile, she'd see, she's like, she kept all these envelopes, but there's no letters. And she she said something like, the things that she kept, and then she'd crumple it up. Yeah. Who knows what the history is between these two? A mother-daughter relationship can be very complicated, so we don't know how much (laughs) affected by her reactions. When Arnon came back from the archives and he had the materials to show the daughter of the von Mildensteins that the father was involved with the Nazi party, 
you know, he had evidence there. You know, he presents the daughter of his grandparents' friends with these facts. And, of course, much like the mother, she's in denial, you know, well, this is evidence that her father may have been, um, you know, not as nice a person as maybe she remembers because she was quite young when that happened. So for me personally, and, and this may just be a modern gesture, I, I felt like since Arnon understood that these aren't the, you know, the crimes of his generation, so to speak, that there should be some forgiveness and that maybe I, and I think he, he did understand that she needed some time to, you know, absorb some of those facts. But I felt like I wanted to see him say to her, you know, our family has been friends in the past and you, you know, I understand that you need some time to absorb this because in the same sense, when he called her and he said that there was a lot he had to learn, I Picking up that she told him, take all the time you need, because she didn't want him to just jump into resuming the friendship their families had. She knew that it might be a difficult reality to accept. Why would the parents not have gotten in touch, or the grandparents not have gotten in touch with the, or tried to get in touch with the family that may have still been left in Germany? I don't know that we really know that they didn't, or they maybe already knew that. Uh, now maybe they're on <laughs> lots of places besides uh, Israel, so I don't know. Um, well, the expert there at the end said that a lot of people wanted to believe that there were some good Germans, and it wasn't everybody that was rejecting them, and that it might have been more on the um, Tuchler's right Tuchler's side. Yeah. That the von Mildenstein side of keeping in touch, it might have they might have reached out at first. So I mean, there's a lot of speculation. I I do find it interesting though that like what you said, um, this wasn't just your ordinary Nazi. He was a uh, bigwig in the SS. Plus he was the one who recruited what was it? Um, Eichmann. 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 You know, and. Uh, so this was no low life and this was no, you know, low totem pole guy. So I feel like there's so much more of the story that we don't know because they can't have been so blind as to be just like, oh, this is just our friend. Do, 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 do. I mean, I well, yeah, I, I can't believe that. I, they had to have known what SS officers were. Now, granted, they did leave prior to Des uh, That I'm not saying that right. Uh, the night of, gla- of broken glass. I think they left before that, but I can't I, I can't be for sure because there's not really a date. Uh, 33 comes up, but I think that's when they visited Palestine with the the von Mildensteins and and the Turklers visited. Well, they did say they tried to bring the grandmother with her with them. They mm-hmm. tried desperately to get them to go, but it's just like people that are sitting there watching the waves of a flood lapping up on their steps. Mm-hmm. Like, this can't get any worse than it already is. I'm going to stay here. I say the Nazis were so insidious with their plan. It was like truly a case of this can't be true. Like when the um, they were saying that when the British and the Americans were telling them about the concentration camps, nobody believed them because it was so far outside your spectrum of what you could believe is actually happening. So, uh, you know, people, there's a lot of denial that comes in being human because you just can't accept that some people, some group of people could lower themselves to try to (laughs) virtually, literally exterminate an entire race of people. It's outside our realm of... uh, Well, certainly. At that time it was anyway. I think now we understand that that can happen, but just the ordinary common citizen, a lady who's living her life, can't properly comprehend that this is really happening. And that's how they got them. That's how they're like, okay, we're in the ghettos now. I can't get any worse than this. I mean, just mm-hmm. it's so systematic. It's like the frog boiling in the water. One minute it's kind of warm. The next minute they're dead. So yeah. I don't feel like these are, you know people that could have ever comprehended what was coming towards them and none of us would well yeah i think it was i I think it was very difficult but act four Uh, arnon 
John and Hannah visit the cemetery. Before leaving Germany, mother and son look for a maternal grandfather's grave on a rainy day. Who would have imagined that my mother and I would visit the grave of Heinrich Lehmann, Susanna's husband, my mother's grandfather, my great-grandfather. So one of the things that I wanted to mention about this was that, um, well, for, uh, firstly, uh, in the cemetery, I think that Hannah, Arnon's mother, was she was coming to either a new chapter or a new understanding of the events of the past because, of course, now she's learned that her grandmother was murdered in the concentration camps, and that's a reality she didn't have before. And now they've gone to the cemetery where her grandfather was supposed to be buried, her grandmother's husband, and they're looking for uh, his, his plot. And they've got all the information that they're supposed to have, you know, row this and this section and they get there and there's nothing there. So uh, I don't know your thoughts of that. Do you think that, you know, the person they were too poor to afford a headstone then, or do you think it was probably vandalized? Oh, I don't know. I, I, I did see her coming to the realization that, um, things were starting to sink into. I could, I, see that for sure well yeah I, I think so a lot of Jewish uh, cemeteries were vandalized during World War II I'm thinking that that's probably what happened to his grave mm. I, uh, I had difficulties with the mother watching this in some parts just with her denial that she didn't know these things and you can see you know transitions in her understanding of the events as time goes by finding her grandmother's letters going to germany seeing her old neighborhood seeing the cemetery what's going to say you know when when she was walked to her grandmother's old residence even though the building had been torn down you know she'd been introduced to the idea of that stolper stone and she started forming that idea she was actually speaking it out loud that maybe now that we know where her grandmother lived, they could make an effort to put one there for her. Yeah. Can I just bring up the fact those mega industrial strength kind of uh, shades that they pulled up in the apartment every day? Oh. Did you miss yeah. that? <laughs> yeah, that was that was. I, I'm guessing that that's because um, Palestine. Well, yeah, I know was a desert. I thought it was more about protection because those things are made out of metal. Right. Well, that could be too. Uh, I don't know. It, it, they never said exactly where in in, in Israel those those are, are are located, but but I'm guessing that it, it, that it may have had it may have had a dual purpose. I think I think to Brenda's point, you know, with the the uh, impressive blinds that the grandparents had. Um, you know, it harkens back to wartime because certainly they had periods where people had to cover their windows. They had blackouts because they were bombing and, and such. Well, certainly uh, Israel has gone through a number of wars, but... But keeping in mind the grandparents grew up in Germany. Yeah, but the violence against the Jewish population in Germany, until you got to... To Crystal Lot, uh, the violence was pretty much uh, you no longer work he here because you can't be a judge and be Jewish. Um, I'm sorry, but you can't live here because this is too fine a house for you. And by the way, I'm taking all of your your uh, wonderful paintings because that's too good for you. Uh, <laughs> that kind of uh, it, as Brenda said earlier, it all went kind of slowly it didn't happen all at one time you know it wasn't just like uh, uh, Hitler was elected and, and then uh, everybody went to the concentration camp because they didn't have those camps right away Yeah, they had to think them up mm. so and, and so it all went kind of slowly It's we took this and then we take something else and you know, it was very systematic. It was a plan. 
there was nothing accidental about how they went about doing it. It was very deliberate. And I, I remember seeing scenes of like, you know, there's only like five German soldiers and you've got like 500 Jewish people getting corralled onto these, um, on the trains. And I used to think there's so many more of them. Why didn't they like sacrifice a few of them? And I, it, underlying it, it was always just like, it can't get any worse than it already is. It can't get any worse than it already is. And Jewish people will tell you that too. Why did not? Why did we didn't fight? That's that is one of the reasons why every Israeli citizen is a is a Israeli soldier. Well, and um, part of this is the shame of Hannah's mother, Gerda, the grandmother, because she had the letters of her mother that was writing to her. And in some fashion, I'm sure she was asking for help. You know, there were pictures that the grandmother had come to Israel after they had arrived there. And she still went back to her home country in Germany. And Mm -hmm. so, so by going home, she knew that she was going to have to face the occupation sooner or later. But still... It's like these letters are showing that the grandmother is corresponding with the family, and yet here the you know grandmother ends up dying in the camps. Yeah, and and there was a sense that some of them just would not leave. Right. So it was probably somewhere in between. You know that that she didn't want to um, put herself in harm's way, but she had. You know, who knows? Maybe she lived in her ancestral home, mm-hmm. preserving. Her her uh, heirlooms. Mm-hmm. They said that she said, "This is our home. This is where we've always lived." I mean, she mm-hmm. actually, they said that. So. And Brenda, as we wrap up this uh, this discussion, can you tell us where we can find your work and where you hang out <laughs> on the web and otherwise? Oh well, so I do uh, life on the shit list um, with the five other people. I don't know. There's a bunch. <laughs> And that's Lotzel, and that's on iTunes. So that's basically my internet presence. Okay. Well, thank you for joining us this week, Brenda. I'm glad that we finally had a chance to collaborate. Thank you for listening to The Far Away Nearby. You can visit our webpage at tfnpodcast.com Find our fan page on Facebook Follow us on Twitter at tfndj and visit our companion blog on Tumblr Our show is available on iTunes, Google Play and Stitcher Radio Send us an email at tfnpodcast at gmail.com Text or leave a message at 720-230-6919 This show is a member of the Pride 48 Network Find other shows at Pride48.com. 